Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sama and Diksha. Uh, we're waiting for our guest. Today we're going to have uh, a blogger from Belarus and she will be speaking about the protest in, uh, in Belarus and speaking about what's happening there, what is part of the protest and what are we expecting in the future. She is here, so just one second. Hi. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. Do you hear me well? I hear you well. Can you can you Good. you hear me well? Yeah. <laughs> Great. It's nice to see you and talk to you. Nice to see you too. Uh, it's been I, a while. Yeah, it's been a very <laughs> long while actually. I think since 2011. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it was a pleasure to meet you back in Egypt, and Same it's here. a pleasure to to talk to you now in uh, similar circumstances. And uh, I hope your revolution will be much more successful than our revolution. So I hope you all the best. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, actually, the the reason that I wanted to speak with you today is that uh, we have been following uh, up the situation in Pilarasha for over like the three past weeks. Mm-hmm. It's really what's happening is really uh, inspiring and it raises a lot of questions. So I wanted to have a voice that I trust to tell us what's happening, what has sparked the protest and the uh, uh, tell us what what the protest protesters are facing back there in in Belarus and how can we help and what is your expectations for the future so let's start like in the beginning by you introducing yourself and explain why you're insisting on being an ex journalist not not a journalist <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is Christina and uh, I'm Belarusian and I come from Belarus and I used, I lived there for 24, 26 years, then I moved to Poland and I worked as an um, independent journalist, uh, I mean, it's more like, for Belarus it would be more like opposition journalist because we have no voices for independent uh, journalists in Belarus, so I needed to immigrate first to Poland, then I worked uh, for radio and then I switched to um, to uh, some other media, which Lukashenko hates the most. And so for me, there was sort of no way back. Uh, and I decided to stay in Europe and I kind of uh, met my future husband and we moved together to Germany. So, uh, but I keep track of what's going on there. I still have a lot of connections, friends and family, everybody's still there. And uh, uh, um, it really hurts when something like that is happening. And I was just tracking these events for, you know, I, I, w- I would like to say 24 seven, but I slept for like four hours a day for- five hours a day in, like in the very beginning it was really upsetting and I wanted to just understand what's going on and help spreading the word because our biggest problem was that we had uh, like a bl- internet blackout and a lot of people just didn't have uh, access to information and if they for example t- we had many social networks which were uh, which are still popular in Belarus and which uh, were not available back then in the first couple of days 
so I sort of helped spreading the word. Like uh, I didn't, I knew, for example, that this media is blocked. So I kind of looked at it uh, from where I am now, from Europe, and I was trying to um, spread the word in Twitter or in some other media, which do not require a lot of traffic when you load it um, from your internet or mobile internet uh, back back uh, in my homeland. Um, so yeah, and um, uh, why I insisted on being ex journalist? Because very simple. Because I, um, since I moved to Germany, I just changed my profession. Um, I had around eight years of experience. I was mostly working with social media and um, uh, social media for journalistic organizations back in Belarus or for NGOs. And um, uh, also, there was p partially the experience was connected to uh, normal journalism, like calling people making or meeting people making the interviews or <clears throat> some other materials or doing some photo reports. So um, it was kind of a very mixed variation of all kinds of journalism that exists in in my experience back then. But right now, um, I'm not doing that for living anymore. And I'm not doing it like professionally, because if you are a journalist professionally now in Belarus, I think you have no right to sleep. <laughs> you have no right to <laughs> get distracted at all. Yeah, I can and imagine. Just, uh, yeah, I mean, I can can allow myself now to read or to, to like make some sort of a digest for a day, read the news quickly and find some certain time of the day for that. But um, journalists have to stay on pulse and stay there all the time and ask the colleagues what happened for like an hour that they were absent, you know, because it's really, really, it's very uh, dynamic what's going on there. So this is the tricky part. And a lot of people are actually exhausted now. And a lot of people are uh, really on the edge. You know, I'm reading the um, uh, personal um, notes of my friends on Facebook and all my just people I know from Belarus. Uh, and all of them say that they have sort of ner n n nervous breakdown and they were the doctors. They have some weird like feeling in their head. They were the doctors. They started stressed that they have to like, you know, get distracted, stop tracking the news. But, you know, it's just not possible right now at the moment. You know, it's just really, really hard to just say, OK, I'm not reading the news. I'm done because any moment something like either very good or very bad can happen. And it's like really um, living on the edge. It's not um, uh, I mean, the protesters are not becoming, you know, more radical or less uh, like or more more like changing their like number because the number stays more or less constant all these days. Um, people are about, you know, I mean, people do not change their minds. It's not like they went on the one protest, they've been detained and then they say, OK, you know, now I'm convinced I should stay home now. I will not go because I'm afraid now. You know, it's not like that. People are keep going on the streets, keep keep being um, against Lukashenko and more and more people are joining this um, side, you know, because even people who were more or less ambivalent and did not care, now it's very personal to them because one of their friends or one of their relatives were detained. And so the protesters gaining more and more uh, uh, people at the moment on their side. Um, uh, but the protests are s extremely peaceful, like, Extremely peaceful, if I can say that. Because... But I think the reaction to the protests is not peaceful at all. I know, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's it's really complicated to explain why is it so, because at the moment also I am as a blogger, I experience a lot of, you know, I cannot say pressure, but this annoying comments everywhere, as, like from other people who, for example, already experienced revolution, like Ukraine or Georgia or even Russians. I mean, they're just commenting like, Okay, so now you will give more flowers to the police and they are beating your children and, uh, you know, mothers and go ahead, give them more flowers, maybe that will help. Or the other ones say, oh, okay, maybe you should just find some 100 armed people um, and then the regime will be over. And then I'm saying, I mean, first of all, I'm trying to ignore these comments because they make absolutely no sense. They understand, they don't understand the Russian people that they're extremely peaceful. They have no wish to be violent. They they will try to keep it as as, key, as, as silent, as peaceful as it, as it can be, because we, we saw many examples of how it can turn out, including, you know, your country. And we know that in our situation, we are not the 
people who would go and fight back like you know um we do not have prepared um like people who can actually deal with guns properly against regime because it's nonsense and because why would we do that we would not be much better than them if it will happen you know so um, it's kind of really tricky situation that I'm ask, like I'm, I'm all, always I'm confused how to even react on these comments or these replies on social networks because people just trying to maybe help us kind of say okay go and shoot the police back but they don't understand what, yeah. what's really going on okay so let's take a step back and explain to to every like everybody was listening us and to me what what is spark at the protest lushenko lukashenko has been there for like 30 years now 26 yeah okay so this this new term would have been the 30 like he would complete 30 years in in yeah in, it will be sixth term in term then mm-hmm. okay so what happened why why now uh why why people started protesting now yes So there are many um there are many factors which summed up together. First of all is that we did not have so, so to say we did not have the elections five years ago at all. So 2015 we uh, I mean did not have it visually, yeah. So most of the people just pro, um, sort of um um ignored them. They just said there is no way we can vote for anybody else because there was no significant election coming. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, we sort of didn't have the selections at all five years ago. Uh, it was really not significant, um, the whole uh, pre-election campaign. If, if even there was one, I don't think there was one, you know. It was, like, really, really quiet back then. And so there were no detentions, there were no um, uh, big, big protests because there was nothing to protest about because people were just like, you know, staying home. So that, that means that um, um, the Lukashenko kind of, uh, since we skipped this um, uh, last five years um, elections, now it's been 10 years between 2010 where the protests where I've I still been there in Belarus I saw it with my own eyes of what it was there and between 2020 so now the whole generation the new generation who were like you know 15 10 back then now they are grew up and they did not see because if the Lukashenko is oppressing every single uh, meeting every every single five years then uh, practically um, all the people are aware what can happen if you go protest. They will be um, uh, intimidated, they will be um, questioning whether it's even worth it and so on and so forth. And also oppos- opposition um, uh, will not get enough strength, enough power within this five years the gaps, you know. But this time it was 10 years to prepare. It was 10 years without fear. It was 10 years without big uh, repressions. Okay, like, of course there were some protests, there were some troubles with the economy and so on. But you cannot compare that to what was in 2006 and 2011 when it was actually the protests were the result of what happened uh, during elections and after elections, yeah? Uh, so uh, meaning now that we have a lot of very young people now on the protests, which are 20 years old, 23 years old. So meaning they were back then, they were like 10 or 13. So this is really amazing. And they are not intimidated at all. And they really are, so to say, like, you know, pure. And they really are for the justice. They really are for the better life. And they know how it is to live with mobile internet and internet in principle all their life. They have mobile phones since they were, you know, 10, 15 And they traveled abroad most likely, and they are like really even more 
fresh uh, Belarusian kind of our people, you know, which which are now a big part of our society, uh, and th this this part of um, population is actually is not looking forward to move somewhere abroad, you know. When uh, after two thousand six there was a huge uh, emigration wave, also two thousand ten was uh, resulting some uh, some wave of immigration, and before that, of course, you know, like the end of nineties. But now it seems like since Belarus was not so, you know, it was not like it, it was an uh, extremely poor country where you have no money for, for bread, you know, and it's so bad that you need to move immediately and you need to immigrate. No, it was actually moderate, like, like, like Lukashenko did not allow people to starve, so to say, but it was not possible to grow anyhow, you know, the... The business was always oppressed. The, the like the, the possibilities in Belarus, you cannot compare it to possibilities in, for example, in Europe, right? So, um, uh, yeah. So I was. Uh, so this was one of the results of uh, of why protests happened now. So we sh we had this like critical mass of young people who young people who actually were uh, truly for change in their country, and they were truly um, also their parents. Their parents are the people who started protesting in the end of the 90s, okay. in, the, in the beginning of Lukashenko's um, um, career. <laughs> um, and so this was one of the factors. The second factor is that the lies, the falsification were so, um, what is the word? Um, they were extreme, you know. If he would have written um, that, it, first of all, the falsification were real, and it's already proven. It's been proven many times before when um, many people were sending reports that this is this is like uh, people are counting the votes and some falsifications going, like something shady is going on, yeah. But this time we have a mobile internet. We have Telegram. Um, I don't know. Do you even use it? Do you even know it? The Telegram. Uh, the, I uh, the, I use it. So yeah, so basically this helped us a lot because we have huge Telegram channel there with the uh, young people who coordinate um, the protest okay. uh, to some extent, yeah, because we have no leaders in the protest at the moment, but um, in Telegram we have a couple of channels who give some suggestions, like, okay, let us meet, okay. for example, you know, six o'clock tomorrow or Sunday, and if the other channels sort of agree, uh, and most of them are, and then they kind of repost it, and then all of the people know where we go tomorrow and or day after tomorrow. So okay. it's sort of coordinating everybody at the moment. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so now since we have this Telegram channel, since we have uh, new technologies, it was extremely easy to take any sort of video or photo and set it immediately online so that everybody could see that. And even with a blackout, uh, even the fact that we didn't have internet access, proper internet access in Belarus, all of this information was accumulating by the people who actually did have access to internet, like like myself, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we were collecting it in our sources, and then people who, uh, when the blackdown was uh, over, people were kind of catching up with on events, you know. And then they becoming even more angry, and then they were on the streets, you know. <laughs> so it was convenient. And to finish my thought, I mean, the second um, the second big factor was that Lukashenko actually um, wrote like the like like the expression well is like the, he drew uh, 80 percent for lukashenko and 80 percent you know okay. if he would have done it in a way like okay i have 65 dihanovska has 30 you know then maybe people would have believed that because this sounds already sort of you know believable yeah if you can say so of course it's not true because now what we have is we have 80 for dihanovska so to say i mean from many many sources it um it says that it, the picture was uh, like the uh, reverse, you know, Lukashenko had uh, some like 20 and Tikhanovska had something about like 80, 75, something like okay. that. And if he would have done it a little bit more modest reasonable. way, reasonable <laughs> way, like uh, I have 50 versus 55%, maybe second mm -hmm. tour, but okay, second tour he would have not allowed anyway. He's too, you know, stupid slash proud. Um, so he didn't, you know, he just said, I have 80%. It, it just caused the rage, you know, it caused proud, like honest rage of people who are by their nature are super peaceful and okay. extremely, extremely nonviolent, you know, people were 
in rage. Yeah, I cannot find another word for that. And then they were all on the streets and that's how the whole, you know, nonsense with the violence started. Yeah, because in the first and the second evening, the detentions were really brutal and really... Um, we are still collecting all of the evidences and reading the statements of the people who uh, actually um, experienced all that. And this is this is really horrible. This is like Nazi in the uh, middle of Europe, and like the people say, like Gestapo uh, sort of uh, you know tortures. Okay. So this is really this is really horrible, and they claim that it was in return for the violence from Protestant side. I saw it all with my own eyes, you know, not with my own eyes, but from the screen, from all of the, I, I had a good access to it, you know, I had a, the best picture, yes. even like the better picture than people from in Belarus had it that day or next day. Um, so what I saw is that, yes, there were maybe two or three videos where there was sort of a violence, but it was not a violence in a way like they kind of in the end used it against us um, saying mm -hmm. that there was a violence. It was the violence like uh, six people are attacking, uh, six uh, policemen are attacking one protester and mm -hmm. the men are standing on a little bit behind on the steps, like on the on the stairs a little above and they're filming from above and they're like, hey, stop, let him go. And then they're standing, filming, commenting it for maybe 10 seconds and then they're like, why are we standing? Let's go and help. And they're all running and they're like taking the protester back and dissolving this policeman. Yeah, this was... This, I cannot call it violence, you know, it was just people who were standing for them, for their, like, one for all and all for one, yeah, you know, this, yeah. like, expression. Yeah. So, and there were also another video when uh, the, the police was trying to catch the group of people, and then the even the bigger group of people started jumping on them and kicking, like, they're taking people back, you know. Mm -hmm. They were never hitting any policemen, they were never using any weapons, nothing. It was extremely, you know, um, they just allowed themselves to finally stand for themselves, you know. This was amazing, this was, this was the the breakthrough yeah this is was something that uh, um, that is actually um uh, that changed for this 10 years yeah 10 years ago or like 15 years ago uh, it was more like we're standing and we're peaceful and we're waiting and you do whatever you want to us but we will not fight back this time it was the first time in our history when people actually decided that they have right to uh, you know, to, to throw, to like uh, uh, pull the person out of the police crowd just because it's our person, yeah? Just because he has the head or she has the same value with us, with the rest of the crowd, yeah? And us, the crowd, we are the majority. This was the very strong statement all over this 20 days. Okay, thank you for this, like, uh, detailed, pre uh, like, elaboration. I think we needed it. And so what the demands now, like the key demands that the protester would be satisfied and go back home and think that they achieved what they wanted, that they went, went out in the streets for in the beginning? So what do they need to go back home? Yes, what is the yeah. demands? Yeah, the demands are um, very, you know, simple and obvious as for, for this specific moment is that Lukashenko has to stay, resign. Okay. We need new uh, new honest elections um, and we need all the political prisoners to be released. Yeah, um, okay. we have some of them still are that they're still in prison since like previous protests or uh, recent some recent other events not related to elections. And we already have uh, around 2000 people uh, after this um, elections that are right now not under uh, guard or not under like not in prison, but they're waiting for the court. Uh, because they're still collecting the evidences against them uh, and they will be prosecu prosecuted. Something like, for example, I have a friend of mine, uh, uh, like friend of my youth, yeah, and I mean, she was, she didn't do anything criminal, but she only was a part of um, one of the oppositional candidate um, official team, yeah, she was collecting mm -hmm. signatures for him. And then I think she was on one of the, like some of the protests, but um, what they are trying to incriminate now is that she was sort of a, one of the organizers of all that. And this is three to eight years, you know? And so okay. 2,000 people of the team of this Babarika, this uh, yeah. other opposition candidate, which didn't make it until, um, until elections, he was uh, imprisoned. I mean, now, now he's in prison. 
Um, so these 2,000 people are involved now in the same uh, criminal uh, case, uh, and they are risking to be in prison for the nah, next maybe you know, three to eight years. So this is sad. And we don't want these people to end up in prison, obviously. So this is in our interest now to like, you know, stop it before it, <laughs> it, it pro 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 like uh, went further, step further. And uh, we had around 7,000 detained uh, right after elections. <clears throat> it was uh, like mm, first, I don't know, 5,000, then a little more, then a little more. So in the end, the maximum number was 7,000. Then they stopped. Uh, detaining. I mean, they started detaining again, uh, I think two days ago, or either two, two days ago, three days ago, I think two days ago. Uh, for example, including like yesterday, 261 person were again detained <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> partially, <clears throat> sorry, uh, partially released right away, including 50 journalists. You know, they were also detained yesterday. So um, we were also not sure what will happen to this 7,000 people. So it was more like demand in a bigger scale. Like if you will not release these people, maybe you're thinking about not releasing them immediately. <clears throat> please, this is one of our demands. We are looking forward to see them back again. Yeah, and um, uh, I don't think that, um, I mean, resignation of Lukashenko is you know, a dream of and many, many people in the world right now. Uh, Belarusians, Belarusian immigration, and all of the people who support them, who are like feeling with them. I receive a lot of support from my uh, also subscribers from all over the world, and many of them actually in Russia. I was surprised because I gained a lot of readers right now when I started writing about Belarus. And um, and I was asking them, where are you from? <laughs> and it appeared that, you know, 80% of my current audience is, is from Russia, yeah? So like, okay. some of them were, were joining me now. Mm -hmm. uh, I was writing on my Instagram that it will be um, some live, it will be in English, but, you know, I mean, I, I maybe part of them will understand. So I, I also um, um, was announcing that a little here. Um, but so the point is that many people are waiting for his resignation. But the problem is that he is psychologically not only unstable, he's psychologically not ready for any sort of peaceful um, resolution of the situation. He is going to be showing, he was just showing, did you see this thing with the gun? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's crazy. It's like, what, what the hell, you know, you're yeah. in the middle of Europe, you're not in some lost uh, 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 island in the ocean where the pirates are, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. And um, so... Um, but you see, um, like a peaceful resignation of Lukashenko, that would be the dream of everybody because it will be the easiest for everybody, for absolutely all parts mm -hmm. of uh, all parties. But um, I don't see it is happening. You know, I just don't do not see how it will happen. It must be some pressure from from within, from his sort of elites or from his um, supporters from inside of the government. It will not happen just like that. It will not happen just because he decided so, yeah? He's not the person who would say, okay, I understood my mistake, you know, and just for the, for the sake of dignity and, you know, just to show that he's a real man, he would mm -hmm. not do that because he's not. He's not a real man. He's not a human being in, in my understanding anymore because of all of the things he, he did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're kind of a little stuck at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, like, coming from Egypt, I uh, always ask about the rule of the military in the middle of all of these protests. What is the rule of the military in Belarus? In... So, uh, first of all, uh, military is not even um, involved yet. I mean, I think they, he involved partially some of them in the very last, uh, what was it, Sunday, when the big protest was? I know the, the day when he uh, showed up with a gun, then mm -hmm. he kind of included partially some part of military. But the point is that um, military is not uh, obligated to participate in things like that inside of uh, Belarus. I mean, it's not uh, like um, there is no, in, like even in constitution or, I mean, I've been reading some like official documents recently and it was saying that, okay, um, internal affairs, police, all of that, absolutely, obviously, yeah, if they had have some sort of uh, order, sure. But military do not have the sort of subordination. They have no kind of, um, Lukashenko cannot 
say that you should fight against your own people, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was also one of our hopes that maybe the police will be on the side of people in the end because they are the power who actually can oppose and can like stand uh, behind people, unarmed people, yeah, and just say that's enough, you know? They do not have to shoot anybody. They just have to say that we are on this side and you have to stop, otherwise there will be blood and not our blood, so to say, yeah? Because I think it's mainly, it's more of them than it, it is of the police. Uh, because of the special police, we have something like not many, like two thousand for the whole country. So this, like the brutal, the most brutal ones, the guys in black who are like you know beating everybody to death. So um, uh, yeah, so military. Um, the problem is that um, the boss of the military, I unfortunately don't remember his name. He was saying some nonsense on Sunday today, uh, this Sunday. Something like, uh, yeah, the uh, we will protect uh, our memorials of Second World War, and we will not allow these protesters to ruin this um, like uh, sacred places of like memorials of Second World War. And if they will do that again, we will kind of need to you know destroy them or like act against them. And everybody will like. What was that <laughs> again? <laughs> Why memorials? <laughs> yeah. So they kind of marked that they're here, but yeah. they didn't say anything about we will shoot you guys just because. Yeah, they just yeah. said that we have like these monuments are assigned for us to be like to protect from you. Yeah. And so it was like a little ridiculous. And the guy himself doesn't seem very, you know, clever to me for right now, um, unfortunately. So all of the things he said also back Sunday and later, it was like, yeah, uh, also Lukashenko says some nonsense, like, yeah, we have uh, tanks on the Western borders of Belarus, like Poland is uh, looking forward to get our Grodno region. This is the, the region which borders with Lithuania and Poland. Uh, Poland is looking forward to like bite it off for themselves you know he's just saying some nonsense like european union are again some pirates who will just go and invade country i mean come on i mean i don't even know he's not even in 90s anymore he's like I, I, yeah exactly when I, when i read the news i feel like his he, all his speeches and all his statements are kind of outdated it does yes. not like go with the current uh, current situation around the world and how the world is acting so yeah uh, th we have He's a lost. question here so yeah totally someone was asking what are we talking about we are discussing the situation in Belarusia what's happening with the spark of the revolution and uh, what is the status of press freedom and status of uh, uh like the protests and and uh, and the violations against protests in uh, Russia and what is the future so uh, any questions are welcomed and we would i will go through any questions that come through on the live while we are discussing so um before i forgot about Belarusia. Uh, yeah. So this is our old name, if you know. Uh, it was before 1994. Since 1994, it's Belarus officially everywhere. Of course, it's hard yeah. to remember for many countries all over the world. Also in uh, Germany, they call every, uh, they call us always Weißrussland. And when I'm <laughs> correcting them, because Weißrussland is White Russia, yeah, Belarus, okay. Belarusia. It's almost Belarusia, White mm. Russia. It's the same like uh, origin, so it's like Soviet origin. And okay. so uh, now, <laughs> after protests. German media everywhere, uh, radio, TV, everywhere I watch, they all say Belarus all the time. And okay. now I was like, okay, now next time I go to some, uh, you know, <laughs> institution, they will not ask again if I say I'm from Belarus. They will not be like, huh, where is it from? Okay. <laughs> so so it needed like a positive revolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like positive sign. <laughs> yeah. So... Coming to this, what is your assessment to the coverage about the Belarus? Is it right? Uh, Belar uh, yes, Belarus. Uh, yeah. uh, the coverage on the situation in Belarus, how do you see it and how do you think we can improve it? Because I can see like news on your timeline, on many timelines of some friends, but mm -hmm. I cannot see it widely covered in the international media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a problem with this, I, I admit. Uh, myself, I was thinking of doing something in English as well, because I also have uh, a lot of questions coming from, like, 
friends from all over the world also like Americans are always saying uh, oh we are with you and uh, stay strong and all that and people from some other European countries and you guys and I mean I understand that there is a demand I know also that there are already a couple of um, also telegram channels and some websites where um, you can actually track it in English yeah but see the problem is most of Belarusians who actually understand the situation really well they are occupied with news with a flow of news, which is never ending flow, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. there were a couple of days where you can just sit in the in Twitter and re like, look at the memes and like laugh about Lukashenko with a gun. Yeah, but it, these days are not happening often. Yeah. And also there, we need some, you know, time to little relapse and recover a bit. So this is a little compli complicated. So meaning um, the same people who understand the situation, they cannot in the same time track the monitor the situation and also translate it and spread the word in English. So I see now that there are many people who know English. They also offer me like, oh, let us translate this and that. Uh, I just, um, I think that we will come to the point when uh, it will be, um, the news will occur a little more frequent and uh, a little bit up to date. I know that Germans are already catching up. They are doing this CDF uh, Tagesschau. They include Belarus very often. Uh, I think this is about immigrants who are sitting in Germany and who are like pushing this uh, gender um, also to the news, to the media. This is great. This is what I think works the best, uh, just to work through diaspora so that they could explain in the local language what's going on so that the media can catch up and, you know, do it uh, in a fast way because the media professionals do it the best, you know, because if I will ask one of my friends who's sitting in Belarus now, please write me a text about what's going on in Belarus, you know, they will just say, sorry, I do not know the language or sorry, I do not have the time because I'm constantly, you know, holding the hand on pulse. So I know that the problem exists. Yeah. So, but since this is not a, you know, not a hundred meter run, but a marathon, I think it will be the best, um, my best expectations will last half a year, you know, maybe okay. it will be longer. So meaning that now we need to kind of um, regroup a little, maybe think about a little further, um, like some perspectives, like what do, what, what do we set as, as priorities, if there will be an, like need of making some sort of um, some summaries, like every couple of days for English speaking audience, uh, I think there will be people who would help also with translation. I think there will be people who would catch it and like like forward it further. But um, as I said, as for me, for example, I would love to do that. I do not have time for that because also I have two-year-old son in the house. It's like I'm barely tracking the news already. <laughs> you have your um, own revolution in, in yeah, the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My son is screaming around, Lukashenko, uhadi. <laughs> Quite, quiet. No, no, Lukashenko. <laughs> it's like I turned on the news a couple of times, um, and he was okay. sitting in the room. So now we know that Lukashenko is not a good, but not a good guy. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, even for me, since I was tracking it for almost the ten, like now it's twentieth day, I was trying to write <clears throat> like a sort of a resume article every evening of what was happening during the day and what are the most important points that happened. Because many people who are not from Belarus, they're not tracking it so tightly and they, it's very interesting for them to see it sort of uh, uh, some summary, uh, some quick reads so that they can understand where, where we are. Yeah. And, you know, it's not such an easy thing, easy thing to do because I'm trying to read stuff and watch stuff and make my own, uh, like, um, you know, uh, resume out of it. But, the problem is here that, uh, first of all, yeah, I'm not mentioning that it's exhausting. It's a lot of information. The second problem is that we have a lot of problems now with Russian propaganda. Since our television, uh, we were, again, lucky, super lucky to have our Belarusian television um, co-workers to be decent enough to uh, 600 people where uh, they signed the letter to their, um, um, what is the word, like the, the director, that they are going on strike until Belarusian television shows the truth. Yeah, I could not dream about that in 2006. 2006, they were making the um, uh, materials about, uh, we were standing on the main square in Oktoberska uh, with like camp, uh, tent camp, yeah. And they were making the material about uh, them finding um, the drugs and empty bottles in the morning, yeah? So I know okay. that these people are, I mean, for me, Belarusian television equals lies always, already, mm -hmm. for all these years. And here, all of a sudden, I see, like, 
they are actually decent people, or like maybe the new stuff that came for this 10 years, yeah, again. And this was very big surprise for everybody. And I think for Lukashenko, it was like a really, really painful because I think he didn't expect that to happen at all. And so next thing that happens, the whole airplane full of uh, Russian experts arrives in Minsk and now they're working instead mm -hmm. of these people who left. Yeah. Okay. And so now all of the experts are saying that since Belarusian propaganda was quite uh, straightforward, like um, Lukashenko is good because we are not starving. Yeah. He's like, it's like the propaganda of Belarus is a little bit um, straightforward. There is no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> weird, weird uh, kind of, um, kind of the... hidden messages. Yeah. Okay. So Russian propaganda, on the other hand, is very, very experienced and very, very tricky. Yeah. So whatever they're doing, it works much better. So what are they doing now? Is that in, in my news feed right now, I see a lot of information, which is sort of a, was uh, thought uh, was meant to be in my news feed so that I would also feel some sort of demotivation, disappointment, uh, anger, and so on and so forth. And I know that because I also like uh, read and watched a little bit uh, of um, like experts who, yeah. who explained it in details. Mm -hmm. And that w w what, what happens right now is that they're changing agenda all the time. They are making people talk about some irrelevant nonsense, like, I don't know, discussing Lukashenko with a gun instead of remembering that Lukashenko is the one who has to step down and he's the one who causes the whole nonsense in the country, the whole problem in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is, so they're trying to distract, you know. Mm. Uh, the second thing is the motivation, as already said. Uh, it is this phrase which appeared already on uh, maybe second or even the middle of first week when there was this phrase, yeah, the protests are failing. Yeah, the protests are decreasing. Everything will uh, most likely stop by the end of the week. Yeah, all of this like narrative, it was okay. coming out of nowhere because whomever I asked from my, my friends, they were like, no, we're standing until the end. No, we are, keep, we're keep, we keep what we're doing, what we're doing, yeah? And all of a sudden I hear this phrase and it was coming from many, you know, either social media or some uh, other uh, sort of experts also who were speaking on even independent Russian media. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh, yeah, the protests seem to decrease. Most likely it will not hold another week. Yeah. And now we see 20th day. Not to lie, it is almost the same amount of people on the streets, it's especially in Minsk. Yeah, regions are a little bit different because regions are protesting mostly with their uh, strikes on industrial uh, objects like all of our I mean you you check the news you probably know like most of our huge industrial um, like foundation of our economy who are actually also working on export they are right now either on strike or they are doing this Italian strike uh, the name I don't know how to how you translate is there such a thing like this in translation in English but uh, uh, it's when you are working but you are not working enough you're not mm -hmm. producing enough. You're calling your boss whenever something is wrong with your machine. Whenever the the, the uh, like um, uh, it's not safe enough en enough anymore in your working okay. place. You're like always delaying time. You're always like pretending you're there, but you're not exactly you know doing much more than like more than um, like you you're trying to do as as less as possible. Um, okay, on your reducing place. productivity, but you're there, but there is no productivity. So, yes, I already heard a couple of experts, they were saying that, uh, for example, this um, um, Belarus Kali, I think, it's, um, it's uh, potassium, um, they are producing potassium fertilizers, uh, so they have a plan, uh, like mm -hmm. monthly plan, so now the best uh, expectation is 70% of that plan, so they, the, the productivity dropped. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is only one example. Yeah, I believe that there's like many more. Of course, they're trying to fire these people who are on strike and so on. But um, we will see how it goes, you know, because mm -hmm. regions are again, they are on the streets when there's something big, bigger happening. Yeah, like a weekend, for example. But workday, I think it's more valuable if they are doing something like that in, in industrial objects. Yeah, because many mm -hmm. of these industrial objects are outside of Minsk as well. Okay, uh, so... Are you expecting this to go more violent or to go like peaceful? That there, there will there be any like peaceful uh, rotation of powers in in Belarus? Um, yeah, I already mentioned that. I mean, peaceful 
is would have been possible only with a little better um, kind of a little more sane, psychologically sane uh, Lukashenko. But mm -hmm. since he himself is not exactly okay and not exactly, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 2020, you know, he's not... Mm -hmm not in this, not on the same page at <laughs> yeah. all with the rest of the people. So uh, I wouldn't say that he would step down willingly and peacefully and everything will be over, yeah? I mean, my main expectation, my biggest expectation is either his elites or his surrounding will finally um, stop supporting him for some reasons. We don't know the reasons. We don't know how it will turn out. But it seems that our economy is... Um, like in German, they say going shift, <laughs> like it's like going down uh, very quickly because of all these protests. He spends a lot of money on military, or mm -hmm. not like military, I mean, all this like forces, special police, mm -hmm. uh, these helicopters driving around, they're collecting this like support, Lukashenko supporters uh, protest as well, which is ridiculous because they are like they are threatened to lose their job unless mm -hmm. they go there. Yeah, so this is how it is. So it is. It costs a lot of money for the economy. Yeah. Plus, um, protesters are doing their silent um, boycott, so to say, of our economical system, like buying the hard currency, like dollars and euro, le leaving the banks without currency. Um, or um, right now, Lukashenko already said this magical phrase. Um, Uh, that we will not allow economy uh, to uh, fail or something like that, yeah? Whenever he says this phrase, it means run to the current <laughs> exchange point, run. Okay. <laughs> so basically now the economical situation is going to become worse and worse uh, mm -hmm. on, many, on many points, including the fact that, for example, our biggest kind of, Lukashenko's biggest prow pride also is this IT sector that he kind of um, supported all the time, that he gave them some sort of dotation so that he can they can work with like lower taxes in this special um, IT park um, in Minsk. So they were one of the first who started arguing against violence. So who started, like there was this guy who was completely enraged, he was recording this video, like, you are all cowards, you cannot uh, kind of scare us, we will, blah, blah. so he's like really, really angry, and many IT companies were supporting uh, protesters also with money, so, and now I saw it recently, there was even a number given, but approximately, uh, there were already a couple of companies who relocated from Minsk, Because okay. how can you work if the internet can be down any second, you know? Mm -hmm. You're losing money every time because all of them are working with, you know, the rest of the world, you know, and the mm -hmm. rest of the world cannot connect with them if they have no internet because of Lukashenko. Yeah, it's not even political. It's more like they economically, mm -hmm. it's just bullshit because if you let IT work in your country, you should provide them with good internet access. Otherwise, you will piss them off. And this is logical. So now IT people are thinking about relocation Uh, of relocating or um, partially they already work from home from some um, like some houses which are in the suburbs yeah they are not in the city centers for their safety not in the offices so if they will start re relocation um, that will be a big problem because it's big money it's mm -hmm. a lot of connections it's a lot of international uh, kind of um, co-working co so I mean this is this is gonna be a disaster And also, if people will start moving uh, away, I mean, if they will just start, um, Poland, for example, said that they will accept Belarusians without visa. Okay. Uh, also, people who um, got some injuries and who need uh, some medical treatment, they will be admitted in Poland uh, without visa plus uh, medical care for free. Okay. Uh, and a number of other countries were helping also with like Czech Republic said today that it was will be a half million dollars uh, for uh, like uh, help of uh, people of Belarus. Mm -hmm. We will see how it will be realized because you cannot transport any real like goods and food and everything through the border because one of the trucks like that or two of the trucks like that were stopped on the border recently yesterday mm -hmm. from Poland. Yeah, they were just not allowed in Belarus. This is also would be funny if, they, <laughs> if it would, you know, it would be like admission <laughs> of the pro problems. So, yeah, um, I think that if something would happen, it will happen from the side of Lukashenko's elites who will start uh, dram dramatically losing money at some point, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is here also for Lukashenko is that all of the European banks and like sort of possibility to get any loan will be gone. Mm -hmm. 
it's yeah. already gone. I think most of the European countries will be uh, will not help him anyhow. Yeah. And Putin will also see that, okay, um, I'm the only one who can give him money. So maybe I will give him money for bigger pro- percent, you know, for bigger, uh, like, um, what is the phrase like this, uh, you know, uh, bigger percent of, uh, of uh, return. And mm-hmm. um, uh, this can help. So it will be more expensive to keep Lukashenko in power mm-hmm. than to move him, uh, to, to remove him and to start over sort of, yeah, for all of the elites that are kind of feeding him and supporting him all this time. And so, but yeah, I must say that we're not Russia, of course, we don't have oligarchs and all the same, you know, yeah. type of type of elites. Yeah, but we do have them. We do have people who are standing next to Lukashenko or behind Lukashenko. And I assume that I hope that they would help us at some point just because for their own sake. Yeah, for for their own kind of money and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's just it's just more than just to be. You know, decent person, modest, like a honest person. Yeah, because all of these people who are decent and honest, they already expressed it before, and they already recorded some videos or uh, stand stood on the streets with people. But the elites are not there. You know, you know, they're still hiding. They're still standing behind Lukashenko, and they're just observing how it will uh, end up. So yeah, and about violence, you know, they already restarted their, you know, detentions and violation, uh, like like um, um, violation of also some terms of, for example, for journalists. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they always said, no, no, we're not touching uh, like uh, journalists. But yesterday they detained fifty of them. Yeah, which is weird. So meaning like Lukashenko has some, you know sinusoid of his own whatever <laughs> moon phases or i don't know <laughs> sometimes he's like super brutal then there is no order to detain people it's it keeps quiet and now it's again uh, has restarted since two days so people are again detained in not the same amounts like uh, before but um let us see what will happen in the weekend because weekend is always the most active and in, in, especially sundays sundays mm-hmm. are always the biggest marshes uh, on the streets mm-hmm. and um I'm not sure that Lukashenko is ready to repeat 9th of August mm-hmm. when he will brutally detain a couple of thousands of people and beat them up because it's been already so many conversations around that all over the world. And um, I'm not sure if he is ready to repeat that. It will be just too much, you know. Yeah. Uh, there will be maybe a couple of hundreds of people detained on Sunday, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if they will be beaten to death or whatever like it was in the beginning of August. At least I hope so, because there is no reason for that. Nothing, nothing actually changed. You know, people were same against him 9th of August, same against him now. I mean, there is just a question of somebody's stupid orders in the end. Yeah. So, yeah, there may be violence, but maybe not, not so significant. I would expect that. Yeah. Let me ask you about the journalists and their safety uh, during the protest and during covering what's happening in, in uh, Belarus. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think there is some entities in inside the countries or outside the countries who might help providing more safety like standards and tools for these journalists or it's out of anybody's hand? It's... Uh, it's a, it's a part of a whole systematic raid on the uh, on the protesters yeah you see the problem is that lukashenko sees journalism always has been seen journalism as really big power he realizes that you know that's why i was mentioning that this belarusian television uh, um kind of um uh, the, what is the word like um that they uh, uh, did not stand for him, but they actually expressed uh, something against him. That was a very big, um, that was very painful moment for him uh, because um, this is typical behavior of these autocrats uh, who are uh, this like who are holding their power with the help of television, television, yeah, for with the help of TV. That many people also in Belarus they do not have very good access to internet. I mean, I was very surprised, but. And uh, now, since these strikes have started, some activists who are working with um, strikers, they were saying many people who are striking on the factories, they do not have an email. Okay. You know, it's like, and it's not that hard to have it, you know, <laughs> like I thought it's like 21st century and it is more or less like having a, you know, um, I don't know. Like having a TV or having yeah. a phone. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's, it was really weird for me to hear, but this is how it is. And uh, many, many people 
uh, who are either neutral right now or supporters of Lukashenko, they are being fed by the TV all this time. So, which means that the um, also television and media, which are oppo- uh, which are showing the alternative uh, reality, I, the, Lukashenko finds them um, dangerous, and he he's aware how powerful it is. Yeah. yeah. The other question is that, like, it, only the international attention is keeping him from detaining journalism journalists every single time. Because I see, I myself, I'm watching with very big pleasure. I'm watching the current time uh, TV. Mm-hmm. It is the um, I think the Radio Liberty project in Prague, the TV project, and um, they are really good and they are really uh, no si- like they are taking no sides. It's like showing how it is, and even their guy, uh, not even I mean <laughs> their guy, especially their guy, was also detained uh, uh, yesterday. Yeah, mm, uh, one of the first days. Uh, the 10th of, or 11th of August, uh, there were even um, 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 footages how journalism, j- journalists were kicked with legs, like like the police were trying to <laughs> hit them with legs, taking away um, uh, SD cards from the cameras, mm-hmm. um, breaking some like displays of the cameras and, uh, you know, something like that. So... Um, you see, I mean, it's it's not even, you know, about, like, if you're asking about some sort of support or help from outside, I mean, this is about physical safety right now at the moment, yeah? This mm-hmm. is about staying alive in Belarus. Like, right now, to work and during the protest, especially the big protest, you are under risk of being uh, detained and disappearing, you know? Like, like it happened to some Russian uh, journalists on the 9th of August. They disappeared and they were gone for, I don't know, about a week. Nobody knew where they are, and it was really bad, you know. And uh, there were protests next to, like, uh, this uh, Belarusian embassy in uh, Moscow. Mm-hmm. They were demanding these guys to be released and to even, even to, give an, to get an information where they are, but they didn't succeed. So the guy was in, in prison. He was beaten badly, and uh, not even one guy. I think there were, like, around three or four people who were detained, in Russia, uh, Russian journalists. So... Um, of course, I think the best help uh, for journalism uh, in Belarus would be sort of technical help with some better access to internet, uh, some sort of um, make, maybe some sort of, I don't know how technically can be realized, but some mobile internet which works with VPN or something like that, you know, because mm-hmm. this is what came to my mind when I was thinking, how would I operate if I were there right now? Yeah, mm, this um, because we still got some footage from Belarus from um, uh, first days when the, there was this blackout, uh, but there were few of this good footages from from the ground. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it would be great to have more. And before their card was taken away, maybe we would have knew more if they would have had this better access. This is my, I mean, I I see world a little bit also in it like technological kind of sort of a way. I mean, I I kind of know the value of it. If you have a chance to spread the word on time and that your information is not ruined on the way or like blocked on the way, uh, how valuable it can be in the end, you know? So yeah, some sort of technical support is the only one support that can be. Okay, I want to thank you so much for your time. And Thank for you. this discussion, I hope we can p- pursue more discussions about the updates in, in Belarus. Okay. And I hope all this trends for you and for your friends and family back home and in the diaspora. I can totally imagine how hard it is for anybody to live in diaspora when their people are actually fighting for their freedom back home. So yeah. I wish Thank you, you all, the, all the best. You too. And thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. You too.